Now, in a world of scarcity, we have a problem that comes up called rationing. Like, so, for example, suppose that I had, uh, what's something that everybody in here might want right now? Uh, Dairy Queen Blizzard. Suppose I had three yummy Dairy Queen Blizzards right now. I'm sorry, that's just a bias. You always think, what would I like right now? And then you do it. You guys may hate ice cream. All right, so uh, three Dairy Queen blizzards. Hopefully there would be more than three people in here that want them, or my example doesn't work. But let's assume there's 10 people in here who want those, and there's three of them. How do I decide who gets them and who doesn't? There's a lot of different ways to solve that problem. We divide it up as economists into two categories, price rationing and non-price rationing. So an obvious way would be to auction them off. That's basically the way eBay works, right? If there's only three of something out there and there's 100 people wanting them, they bid against each other, and the three highest bidders get the three things. That's what markets do. Markets work based on price rationing. The price of anything will move up until the number of buyers left equals the amount that's for sale, and we'll cover that in supply and demand. But let's talk about why economists like price rationing by talking about non-price rationing. So there's a lot of other ways to decide who gets those three blizzards. I could do it randomly. I could the three tallest people. Um, all sorts of different ways to do it. And so let me give you a real world example to try to apply this. So I went to Florida State University back when Florida State had a good football team. Wow, they do again. Wow, that's funny. I used to have been for the last 10 years going, no, really, they won a national championship when I was there. But they did this year too. So anyway, all right. So what, what happened at Florida State when I was there is they had a student section. And the students could go to the games for free. Isn't that great? Free. You know, you could, the student section sat 3,000 students. Do you know how many students were at Florida State University? Like 20 some thousand. Now when you're playing Duke and you're going to cream them like a hundred to two, like that's fine. Not that many students want to go to the game, but back then we had two number one versus number two games at home the same season. We played Miami and Florida, both one versus two games. There were more students wanting to go to the game than their tickets available. So what solves this problem? Well, they do it the same way Duke does with their basketball tickets for the free student tickets. They have a ticket booth that opens at, you know, noon on Wednesday and the first 3,000 people in line get the tickets. First come, first serve. It's another form of rationing. So you want to predict what happens for those big games? People line up. In fact, the, the little student newspaper used to do a story every game week on interviewing the last person in line who was able to get a ticket and ask them how long they'd been waiting. And it was a really cool sight to see because the kids would be camped out for three or four days with tents waiting in line to try to get up to the front of the line. So for those number one versus number two games, both of them were a four-day wait to get the last ticket in line, meaning everybody else who got a ticket had waited more than four days. If you were there three days or less, you weren't going to get a ticket. Now, here's why we want to talk about about this and why it's so important. When you choose a method of rationing, you're incentivizing a certain kind of behavior. When you ration by first come, first serve, what are you encouraging? People to wait in line. And so the students, they're not in my classes, they're not learning things because they're camping out trying to get football tickets. Imagine how different the world would be if instead we rationed tickets by, say, the 3,000 students who want to go with the highest GPAs. They might have spent those four days studying to try to do better on their test. And that's something productive. Right? And economists, when we look at different ways of rationing things, that's why it's so important because it changes how people behave. You guys are probably too young to remember one of the funniest commercials about this. But there used to be this Bud Light commercial where it had this picture of this bar that had a sign that said, Ladies Night Thursdays, uh, Ladies Drink Free Bud Light. And anyway, what the commercial does is it's got these three construction workers, you know, big manly bearded guys, dressed up in dresses with way too much lipstick on, <laughs> trying to sneak in the bar to get free Bud Light. But it's a, if the rationing devices, hey, if you're a woman, you get free Bud Light. What do people want to do? Be a woman to get free Bud Light. And it's just kind of another example of that. But by rationing by price, we give people an incentive to go work and earn money. So if I want to buy things, I need income. How do I get income? Well, I go spend my time productively trying to work and earn income. So there I have, therefore, I have the income to purchase stuff. So economists are big fans of rationing by price. It also helps to make sure that the people who get them are the people who really want them. If I take those three blizzards and I give them out randomly, I may give one to somebody who's lactose intolerant. You know, if you're bidding on it, I'm assuming you're not in that group. You wouldn't be trying to get it, right? So there's a lot of good things about price rationing. Your book covers those in a little bit more detail.